So welcome everyone to this Thrombosis Canada, World Thrombosis Day webinar on women and thrombosis. We'll be giving you the opportunity at the end of the presentations to ask questions. We'll be using the chat feature for that. This slide presents my disclosures of financial support. For those who don't know me, my name is Shannon Bates. I'm a professor of hematology and medicine at McMaster University. My clinical and academic interests are in venous thromboembolism with a focus on thrombosis issues in women. I was the lead author for the 7th, 8th, and 9th editions of the American College of Chest Physicians Evidence-Based Clinical Practice Guidelines for Antithrombotic and Thrombolytic Therapy with reference to venous thromboembolism in women, and also chaired the 2018 American Society of Hematology Guideline Panel on Venous Thromboembolism in the Context of Women. On January 1st, 2014, I was named McMaster University's Eli Lilly Canada May Cohen Chair in Women's Health. I'm the Chair of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, Area Focus Competence Committee in Adult Thrombosis Medicine, and Co-Editor of Thrombosis Research. Clearly, I may have done a lot of things academically. I've never used a mouse. This program has received no financial or in-kind support. The content of this program was reviewed by the faculty and peer reviewed by Thrombosis Canada. Recommendations involving clinical medicine are based on evidence that is accepted within the profession and all scientific research referred to, reported or used in the program in support or justification of patient care recommendations conforms to the generally accepted practice. Our faculty today joining me are Dr. Maha Othman and Dr. Nadine Shahata. Dr. Othman is a clinical pathologist with specialized training in hemostasis laboratory testing and molecular genetics of bleeding disorders. She obtained her master's and PhD degrees from Mansoura University in Egypt and Southampton University in the United Kingdom. She holds positions in the School of Medicine, Queen's University, the School of Baccalaureate Nursing at St. Lawrence College in Kingston, Ontario, and the Faculty of Medicine, Mansoura University, Egypt. Her research interests include the clinical and molecular aspects of von Willebrand disease and platelet disorders, assessment of coagulopathies in women in pregnancy and in cancer, and thromboelastographic applications. She has more than 110 publications in peer-reviewed journals, and her research is recognized internationally. Dr. Nadine Shahata is the Director of Transfusion Medicine at Sinai Health Systems and Associate Professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto. Her research interests focus on knowledge translation. She is an expert in both systematic review methodology and guideline development. She is currently the co-principal investigator for the transfusion requirements in Cardiac Surgery 3, TRICS 3 randomized control trial. Our program learning objectives are on this slide. At the end of this presentation, participants will be able to describe current evidence of thrombosis risk in common female cancers, describe an approach for management and prevention of pregnancy-associated superficial vein thrombosis, and explain the impact of mechanical valves when considering anticoagulation for patients who are pregnant. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Offman. Okay, hello everyone. Thanks Dr. Bates for the kind introduction. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about hypercoagulability and VTE risk in women, specifically under chemotherapy for breast and gynecological cancers. So here are my disclosures. My learning objectives basically to discuss the impact of cancer chemotherapy on thrombosis risk in light of cancer and patient-specific risk factors, and present some research data that are unpublished I'm going to share with you today, and finally talk about uh, the personalized approach and the importance of this in assessing the risk. So we celebrate World Thrombosis Day today, and we care about thrombosis because statistics tell us that one in four people currently die from conditions caused by thrombosis. Now, those are three major ones that are myocardial infarcture or heart attack, thromboembolic stroke, and venous thromboembolism. And when we say venous thromboembolism,
embolism, typically VTE, is when you have thrombosis in the deep veins of the legs, that's DVT or DVM thrombosis, or in the lung vasculatures, that's pulmonary embolism or PE. So the relationship between thrombosis and cancer has been established over 150 years ago when Armand Trousseau, the French scientist, described for the first time superficial thrombophilobitis minor clots in the superficial veins in cancer patients. And later on, Rudolf Verkau, the German scientist who we celebrate his birthday today, have established the triad where stasis, hypercoagulability, and vessel wall injury are three basic me mechanisms, pathological mechanisms behind the development of thrombosis. We now know that cancer promotes a hypercoagulable state and increase your risk of VTE. Now, the tumor does this by many different mechanisms, directly and indirectly. It stimulates the coagulation mechanism by releasing many procoagulant elements and activate platelets as well. And indirectly, if the tumor can invade nearby blood vessel and stimulate your neutrophil and generate what we know as neutrophil extracellular traps that binds VWF, a sticky protein important for coagulation, and also activate endothelium and platelets. When it comes to the risk of VTE and cancer, I think there are important numbers that we have to stop and think about. In the general population, we know that about 117 patients can develop out of 100,000 patients in the general population. Now, this risk of uh, is four times higher when you have cancer, and if you are under chemotherapy, the risk goes up to seven times. Five to 10% of all cancer patients may develop an event of VTE within one year of diagnosis, and it is a cause of death. It is considered, in fact, the second common cause of death in cancer patients. <laughs> Cancer-associated thrombosis is a huge burden, not only on patients, but also on healthcare systems. As you can see from this elegant diagram, it shows it increases the symptoms and morbidity, it increases mortality, increases emergency care visits. Of course, it impairs greatly the quality of life of these patients. And also it comes with risk of bleeding because of medication. It increases healthcare costs as a result of those medications. They are not cheap and also other healthcare costs. Now, a major problem is that some patients may not be aware of that risk. In fact, in a World Thrombosis online survey that was published uh, last year in JTH, this survey showed us that over 60% of patients say they do not know that they have a risk of VTE. And over two thirds of the respondents have reported that they have not received information from their physician about the symptoms and signs of VTE. So this is significant. Thrombosis is on the list of WHO Global Patient Safety Action Plan 2030. It is considered an avoidable harm, and that's why it's listed among their strategic initiatives. And because we can diagnose or at least assess the risk <clears throat> and predict thrombosis, it is considered an avoidable harm, and we need to do some work. When it comes to women-specific cancers, this pie chart shows the incidence and mortality of various cancers in women. And this data comes from Global Cancer Statistics, or Global Can, that looked at 35, can, 36 different cancers in 185 uh, 85 countries. And you can see, in terms of the incidence, breast cancer remains on the top of the list. Things like cervix or ovary, the specific gynecological cancers for women, despite the fact that they are much lower in percentage, they still carry a high risk of mortality. Let's zoom in into gynecological specific cancer and talk a little bit about the risk of VTE in those cancers. It is now estimated that ovarian cancer carries the highest risk of VTE. The percentage of VTE can reach up to nine to, to 11%. And in specific histological types of this cancer, like clear cell carcinoma, this risk can be up to 40%. In endometrial cancer, the VTE rate is between six to 13%, but the mortality rate is huge. Uh, in a comparative analysis between endometrial cancer with VTE and without, you can see that the risk of VTE, uh, the risk of death is higher up to 42% compared to 9% only without the VTE. When it comes to breast cancer, again, we have to stop and think a little bit about those numbers. It is estimated that one in eight women in their lifetime can be diagnosed with a breast cancer. 
every 14 seconds, somewhere in the world, someone is being diagnosed with a breast cancer. The World Health Organization has estimated and predicted there will be an increase over 3 million new cases and 1 million deaths by 2040. When it comes to the VTE rate in breast cancer, although this is not one of the highly thrombogenic cancers compared to ovarian or endometrial or even other non-women specific cancer like pancreatic, we still see about 6% of VTE a year, especially those under chemotherapy. And those women who were pres are prescribed uh, hormonal therapy like tamoxifen, the risk is doubled and tripled sometimes. Of course, we are not saying that every woman who's diagnosed with a cancer will eventually get a VTE. There are, are many factors that increase the risk of VTE in those patients. Certainly advanced age, obesity is a big one, some ethnic background increased your risk, the advancement of cancer stage, metastatic disease, the presence of comorbidities like cardiovascular morbidity, um, uh, diabetes, hyperlipidemia. But the most important one is cancer therapies. Now, those therapies, whether chemotherapy or radiotherapy, do increase the VTE risk, not only in women, but overall. So the reason for that is that those therapies do stimulate active and activate platelets, a, a trigger or key in coagulation. They also damage your endothelium and leading to cytotoxicity and activation and secretion of procoagulant factors. They also inhibit the anticoagulant mechanism that protect us against clotting, and they can stimulate some cells like monocyte to stimulate tissue factor release, which is a key trigger for coagulation. Okay, if that's the case, then why don't we give people thromboprophylaxis anticoagulation? Well, as you can see from these large studies and current guidelines, do not recommend thromboprophylaxis routinely in ambulatory cancer patients. In fact, most of these guidelines would say you would give anticoagulation to people who have high risk or at least intermediate risk, and they are not in active bleeding, and they don't have a high risk of bleeding. So the trick really is to assess risk appropriately in individual patients. Well, luckily, we do have risk assessment models that are known to assess the risk for VTE. However, there are very, some issues with that. The Corana score that has been established since 2008 has been validated in many solid cancers, but not in all cancers. It takes into consideration the site of cancer, the pre-chemotherapy hemoglobin, the white blood cell count, and platelet count, and give you a score to assess your risk before the start of chemotherapy. The modification that happens after that, Vienna CAT score, for example, additionally adds some procoagulant factors like D-dimer and soluble P-selectin, and some include the type of chemotherapy because we know that some of them do increase your risk a bit more than others. So the variety of risk assessment tools are there. However, in gynecological cancers, uh, at least the Corana validated score has given very little or no predictability of VTE risk in those women. Thromboelastography is a coagulation test, a special coagulation test that gives you a uh, full picture of coagulation from A to Z. And as you can see here, this is a coagulation analyzer bench top where you put a drop of blood and you get a trace that gives you everything about the coagulation and fiber analysis from start to finish. I'll take you quickly through that because this is what I will use in the research data. So the R time is really the time that it's taking to formulate the initial fibrin thread formation. And alpha angle and K time are reflective of the rapidity by which the fibrin is being formed inside this clot in the cup of this machine. The maximum amplitude is a, a measurement of the width of the trace, which gives you an idea about the strength of the clot and how good the clot is. And lysis time would give you an idea about the lysis after coagulation. And there is an overall coagulation index CI that gives you an idea, calculated idea of how coagulation is. Hypercoagulability based on this machine is indicated by a short R time, short K time, increased alpha angle and MA and increased CI and reduced lysis time 30. So this is a real time viscoelastic test that is considered somewhat superior to the to the conventional testing. I've used this in my research group for the past decade or so, and we've applied it in animal and human studies and including cancer. And most recently we published through the um, prostate cancer, which, which is not highly thrombogenic cancer. However, uh, we have shown th that it detects hypercoagulability and can predict VTE in those patients with a reasonable sensitivity and specificity.
Let me now short, share with you some uh, data from an ongoing study on hypercoagulability and VTE risk specifically in women cancer. In collaboration with wonderful colleagues from Kingston General Hospital here, we recruited ovarian, endometrial, and breast cancer uh, patients uh, who in their standard of therapy, chemotherapy was prescribed, and we recruited them before chemotherapy, took blood samples to assess the coagulation. We applied Corona score, and we assessed coagulation also after the first and second cycle of chemotherapy. We followed up these patients for six months to an any VTE event was recorded. The idea was to see if TEG, the thromboelastography, can detect hypercoagulable state in these women, can inform VTE risk, and if there's any relationship between the results that we get from this test and Corona score as some an established risk assessment model. We also looked at other risk factors in those patients. So far, we examined 36 women with cancer under chemotherapy, 18 were breast, 11 were endometrial and seven were ovarian cancer. And as you can see from this table that shows clinical and demographic data, there is a huge diversity among patients. We see in terms of age, anything from 35 to 85. We see some with metastatic disease, some menopausal, some have high BMI. Certainly this is huge in the cohort. A variety of comorbidities. The smoking is a factor too. The type of chemotherapy is different, but the Corana score has not been high. In fact, only few have high score uh, in terms of Corana. So I want to show you the comparative analysis of tech parameters before and after chemotherapy. And using repeated measures and over here, we were able to show there are significant changes in all parameters of tech towards co coagulability or hypercoagulability after uh, chemotherapy and that the effect seems to be higher after the first dose of chemotherapy after cycle one. This is a simplified uh, view of a tag overlays that represent three patients. And as you can see, the white line here is the tag before chemotherapy and the green is the tag after chemotherapy. And the bigger the trace, the wider the MA, of course, that is an indicative of hypercoagulability. So I wanted to give you a visual representation. Now, in some patients, the coagulation go back to normal or close to normal, as you can see from the top trace. We were curious to see if there's any difference between the types of cancer in terms of TEG. And indeed, based on two parameters of TEG, we show significant changes towards ovarian cancer, which is in line with literature being a highly thrombogenic cancer compared to the others. We wanted also to see if there's any relationship between the tech parameters data and the coronary risk assessment score. And indeed, we found that the two parameters, MA and CI, showed significant difference towards coagulation or hypercoagulability when the coronary score is being increased. And we verified the MA relationship by Pearson correlation, showing the significant association between tech MA and coronary. So this has promised that the TEG analysis could be an added tool to help better assess the risk in these patients. Over the six months of follow-up, we have identified five patients developed VTE. And as you can see from those tables, those are the five patients. Some had DVT, some had PE, some had both variety of all risk factors, including the age, the menopausal state, the BMI, the comorbidity and smoking, and in fact, also different types of cancers. But if you look at the Corona score, it's still not very high. So what do we say about this? Well, I think there's potential in tech to aid in the risk assessment, but there are important home take home messages that I wanna share with you to finalize this uh, presentation. I think we can confirm from literature or from the data that I showed you that women's cancers do come with increased risk of VTE. Chemotherapy and other types of therapies and cancer-specific and patient-specific factors do increase this risk further and need to be assessed. There's potential for things like TAG to improve the application of Corona score and help better assess these people. And the most important is a personalized approach is the way to go. I think we need to individually in each patient to assess the risk of thrombosis and the bleeding both together and decide based on the current guidelines if anticoagulation is gonna be pre prescribed or not. And finally, large studies are still needed to focus specifically on women's cancer, to study it more, to allow to uh, evaluate something like TEG. And I think those studies definitely align with Thrombosis Canada um, and uh, World Health Organization future goals. And thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
just quickly thanking everybody in my lab and trainees and students who participated in generating this data and the funding agencies and my collaborators at Queen's University. Thank you for that fascinating presentation, Dr. Othman. We'll turn now to superficial vein thrombosis in pregnancy. My objectives today are to present new data on the risks associated with pregnancy-associated superficial thrombophlebitis or superficial vein thrombosis, to review current guideline recommendations for treatment of superficial vein thrombosis in pregnancy, and to discuss an approach for management and prevention of pregnancy-related superficial vein thrombosis. Superficial vein thrombosis occurs when thrombus formation in the superficial vein develops with associated wall inflammation. Superficial vein thrombosis most commonly involves the lower extremities with the greater saphenous vein involved in 60 to 80% of affected individuals. It is sixfold more common than venous thromboembolism with a yearly incidence of 0.64% per year. The risk factors for superficial vein thrombosis are similar to those for deep vein thrombosis, with the exception that varicose veins are an important risk factor for lower extremity superficial vein thrombosis, and catheters or intravenous cannulation are important risk factors for upper extremity superficial vein thrombosis. The clinical course for superficial vein thrombosis is usually self-limited, but it is not always benign. In those with superficial vein thrombosis involving at least five centimeters of the vein, 25% will have deep vein thrombosis at diagnosis, and 4% will have concurrent pulmonary embolism. In patients without deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism at diagnosis, 3% will develop symptomatic deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism over the ensuing three months. 2% will develop new superficial vein thrombosis and 3% extension of their current superficial vein thrombosis over the same time frame. This slide presents a management scheme for superficial vein thrombosis in the general population, and it's taken from the Thrombosis Canada website. Management depends on whether there's concurrent deep vein thrombosis and also on the length of the superficial vein thrombosis and its proximity to a junction with the deep venous system. Patients with concurrent deep vein thrombosis receive therapeutic anticoagulation as for that indication. Those with superficial vein thrombosis within three centimeters of a junction with the deep venous system are at very high risk for extension into the deep venous system, and so three months of therapeutic anticoagulant therapy is recommended. Those with the proximal extent more than three centimeters from the junction with the deep venous system, but at least five centimeters in length, are also at increased risk for those complications over the three months that I discussed and low or intermediate dose anticoagulants for a short course are recommended in these individuals. Patients with more distal or smaller or less symptomatic events can often be managed with topical or systemic non anti-inflammatory agents. For those patients with superficial vein thrombosis at least three centimeters from the deep venous system and at least five centimeters in length, Options for treatment include prophylactic or intermediate dose low molecular weight heparin, prophylactic fondaparinux, prophylactic dose rivaroxaban, and then in, for 45 days. And then in the other group of patients, you may choose to use oral or topical non anti-inflammatory agents. But what about superficial vein thrombosis in pregnancy? So until recently, we did not have reliable data on the frequency or risk of developing superficial vein thrombosis in pregnancy. On this slide, I have data from a Danish nation, nationwide cohort study that was published in Lancet Hematology in 2023. The authors took data from all pregnant women delivering in Denmark between January 1st, 2007 and December 31st, 2017. So that was over 1.2 million pregnancies in 733,000 women. And what they found is that the incidence rate for superficial vein thrombosis in pregnancy, including 12 weeks postpartum, was 0.6 per 1,000 patient person years. So approximately half of the risk of developing venous thromboembolism during pregnancy in the postpartum period. As with deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, the postpartum period was highest risk with an incidence rate of 1.6 per 1,000 person years. 
And during pregnancy, the risk increased from 0 0.1 per 1,000 person years in the first trimester to 0 0.5 per 1,000 person years in the third trimester. How do we manage superficial vein thrombosis in pregnancy? Well, first, if we're going to use anticoagulants in a way similar to what we do in the general population, we need to think about what anticoagulants are safe to use in pregnancy. And ideally, you would only use anticoagulants that do not cross the placenta. So neither low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin cross the placenta. Low molecular weight heparin is generally preferred due to a better maternal safety profile with a lower risk of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and a lower risk of heparin-associated osteoporosis and a longer half-life and better predictable dose response allowing for once daily dosing without monitoring. Fondaparinex does cross the placenta in small amounts. There is clinical experience with use during pregnancy, but most of these ex published experiences are in the second or third trimester. The vitamin K antagonists like warfarin cross the placenta and have the potential for teratogenicity, pregnancy loss, fetal bleeding if used close to term, and neurodevelopmental deficits. The direct oral anticoagulants cross the placenta. Animal reproductive toxicity has been reported. Reproductive effects in humans are not well known. The data are limited. Available data sets suggest that there may be a 4% risk of major birth defects with direct oral anticoagulant exposure during pregnancy. However, a specific syndrome has not been identified. Similarly, if you're going to treat someone with superficial vein thrombosis in the postpartum period, you need to think about which anticoagulants are safe while breastfeeding. So again, you would like to use anticoagulants that either do not get into the breast milk or, and or are not orally available. Unfractionated heparin does not cross into the breast milk due to its large size and negative charge. Low molecular weight heparin is excreted into the breast milk in small amounts, but with limited bioavailability, and so is unlikely to be absorbed by the newborn and is considered safe. The same reasoning applies with fondaparinex. The non-lipophilic vitamin K antagonists, like warfarin, don't appear to be secreted into breast milk, and small studies have, been, have shown no detectable levels, and so they're considered safe as well. The direct oral and anticoagulants do appear to have the potential to cross into the breast milk in small amounts. We have limited experience with these medications and that small amount crossing into the breast milk um, has made it so that we recommend against using these agents during pregnancy as we have alternatives. So for both during pregnancy and while breastfeeding, low molecular weight heparin is a preferred anticoagulant. The Society for Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada published guidelines that included for the management of superficial vein thrombosis in 2014. These guidelines are based on extrapolation from the non-pregnant population, and they recommend that for pregnant women with superficial thrombophlebitis, compression ultrasonography should be performed to exclude deep vein thrombosis, and it should be repeated if symptoms worsen within a week. They recommend prophylactic or intermediate dose low molecular weight heparin for one to six weeks in pregnant women with bilateral superficial thrombophlebitis for very symptomatic women and for superficial thrombophlebitis within five centimeters from the deep venous system or affecting at least five centimeters of vein. Observation alone is recommended for women with superficial thrombophlebitis felt to be at low risk of deep vein thrombosis and for those who don't require symptom control these individuals should have clinical follow-up within seven to 10 days with the com repeat compression ultrasound within a week. The American Society of Hematology also published guidelines in 2018 that included a recommendation for women, pregnant women with acute superficial vein thrombosis and they recommended for those with proven, i.e. ultrasound confirmed superficial vein thrombosis that low molecular weight heparin be used over not using any anticoagulants. This was a conditional recommendation with low certainty because again, it was extrapolated from the non-pregnant population. However, it was felt that anticoagulants were likely to reduce the risk of venous thromboembolism in this setting and be associated with a low risk of bleeding only. It was acknowledged that the benefits might be less for more distal or less symptomatic superficial vein thrombosis and particularly for needle averse patients 
panel members agreed that they would treat for the remainder of pregnancy and for six weeks postpartum. Fonda Paranex and Riverox then crossed the placenta, so low molecular weight heparin was preferred. And there was no agreement amongst panel members on low molecular weight heparin dosing. So what happens if a, a pregnant woman develops superficial vein thrombosis in pregnancy? Are the risks high enough to justify these guideline recommendations that I've just reviewed? Well, again, we can look to that Danish nationwide cohort study. And if we look at the 211 women with antepartum superficial vein thrombosis who did not have concomitant deep vein thrombosis and who did not receive a prescription for anticoagulants, the cumulative incidence of venous thromboembolism during the rest of that pregnancy and during postpartum was 13%. And if we restrict our analysis just to the same antepartum period, it was approximately 10%. For the 394 women with postpartum superficial vein thrombosis, the cumulative incidence of venous thromboembolism during the same postpartum period was 2.7%. These values exceed ASHA's risk threshold for prophylaxis that they used in their guidelines, and so indicate that prophylaxis is warranted based on this new data that we just reviewed. The other common scenario that we see is the question of what to do with pregnant women who have a prior episode of superficial vein thrombosis. We have some data that suggests that superficial vein thrombosis is a risk factor for future venous thromboembolic events beyond the three months that I discussed. Here we have data from the Multiple Environmental and Genetic Assessment of Risk Factors for Venous Thromboembolism or MEGA study, which was a large case control study um, conducted out of six Dutch anticoagulant clinics. And what they showed is that overall individuals with a history of superficial vein thrombosis had a 5.5 fold increased risk of venous thrombosis compared to the general population over the long term. When individuals with previous superficial vein thrombosis and an acquired risk factor for venous thromboembolism were studied, the odds ratio for venous thrombosis was 9.3 for previous superficial vein thrombosis and a mild thrombotic risk factor, 31.4 for previous superficial vein thrombosis and a strong thrombotic risk factor, and 34.9 is shown in red here for women with a previous superficial vein thrombosis and a reproductive risk factor that could include pregnancy or other hormonal therapy. Unfortunately, we weren't able to specifically look at the risk of pregnancy as there were no control subjects with a combination of superficial vein thrombosis and a subsequent pregnancy. But this suggests that women with a history of superficial vein thrombosis are at risk of recurrent superficial vein thrombosis and venous thromboembolism during future pregnancies. Well, how long might this increased risk persist? So again, we look at Danish studies and they are able to use their national registry of patients to look at questions such as this. So using their entire population between 1980 and 217, so approximately 7.1 million individuals, they were able to determine that persons with a previous history of superficial vein thrombosis had a risk of venous thromboembolism of 18 per 1,000 over a median of seven years of follow-up for an adjusted hazard ratio compared to the general population of 8.55. And as you can see in the figure and in the table in red, that increased risk was definitely a, a time specific. So the highest risk was most proximate to the superficial vein thrombosis with a hazard ratio of 71.4 over the first three months. But the risk persisted out to more than five years after the superficial vein thrombotic event with a hazard ratio of just over five. So what does this mean for our patients? This data suggests that women with prior superficial vein thrombosis are at increased risk of venous thromboembolism risk in subsequent pregnancies. The problem we have is that there are no guideline recommendations specific to this scenario and no studies specific to this scenario in our patients. So we can anticipate that the magnitude of risk that our patients might face is likely dependent on multiple factors, including 
time since the previous superficial vein episode, as I discussed, but also patient baseline risk factors, the characteristics of the previous superficial phobitis episode, other thrombotic risk factors like thrombophilia, and some risk factors that might develop during pregnancy, like need for bed rest. How these risk factors might combine, whether it's additive or multiplicative, is unknown. But if we assume a multiplicative risk factor model, then in the table at the bottom of the slide, I've estimated what the absolute risk might be during the antepartum or postpartum period based on time since superficial vein thrombosis until pregnancy, and using a baseline risk of venous thromboembolism of 0.6 per 1,000 in each of the antepartum and postpartum periods. And as you can see, if the superficial vein episode occurred within three months of pregnancy, the risk during both the antepartum and postpartum period is substantive at approximately 4%. If that event was between three months and one year, then the risk is closer to 1% in each of the antepartum and postpartum periods. And what I'll highlight again is that the ASH antepartum and postpartum thresholds for prophylaxis are 2% and 1%. So for patients with fairly recent superficial vein thrombosis, they may qualify for prophylaxis during the postpartum period just based on time in the loan, and if very recent, both the antepartum and postpartum period. And those with additional risk factors would likely qualify for prophylaxis, especially during the postpartum period. In the absence of good data, you're going to need to use some shared decision-making with your patient. And that shared decision-making is important because our evidence is low quality and we don't have guideline recommendations. And we want to consider patient values and preferences because there are implications for maternal health. There are definitely burdens for the mother and the mother may have a desire not to medicalize pregnancy. So in this shared decision-making model, you're gonna present data to the best of your ability and knowledge with respect to risk what the option for intervention, i.e. prophylactic low molecular weight heparin might be, the drawbacks of that intervention, and then you're going to have a discussion with the patient about their values and preferences, and together you'll reach a decision. For those who elect not to receive prophylaxis, it's important that you review the signs and symptoms of venous thromboembolism with them and emphasize the need for them to seek medical attention urgently should they occur. And you also need to review with the patient and their other care providers the need to review the need for prophylaxis should new risk factors for venous thromboembolism develop. So the take home messages are the incidence of superficial vein thrombosis during pregnancy in the postpartum period is low, but that pregnancy related superficial vein thrombosis is a strong predictor of venous thromboembolism during the same pregnancy and postpartum period. Guidelines suggest low molecular weight heparin for pregnancy related superficial vein thrombosis with high risk features. A prior history of superficial vein thrombosis appears to increase the risk of venous thromboembolism in future pregnancies, but the role of prophylaxis remains unclear. And given the low quality of available data, a shared decision-making model is preferred. So I thank you for your attention and I'll turn this over to Dr. Shahata. Thank you, Shannon, that was great. Um, can you hear me okay yet? Okay, um, so um, thank you for asking me to present today. Um, my name is Nadine Shahada. I'm a hematologist, and I think I might just present my disclosures on this slide as opposed to the subsequent slide. I'm going to be presenting on anticoagulation for pregnancies with prosthetic heart valves, and the aim really is to optimize anticoagulation regimens. So, um, like I mentioned, I think I just need to update the slide a little bit. Um, so. For the past uh, 10 years or so, I've been the co-director of the Hematology and Pregnancy Clinic at Mount Sinai Hospital. I'm also the fellowship director for the Maternal Hematology Academic Fellowship. Um, I've had a number of publications focusing on anticoagulation for um, the, this patient population, and I will try to remember discussing that as I go through the slides, because I've included a number of slides from our publications. I have recently received funding actually for two studies, one from ISTH looking at a decision making for, for physicians and patients um, when electing to choose anticoagulation regimens for prosthetic heart valves um, during pregnancy. And recently for, um, I've received funding from 
the Halliwell Foundation for a prospective study looking at anticoagulation regimen in this patient population. So I just have one learning objective that really by the end of this presentation that you'll have an appreciation of the balance between risk and benefit for the anticoagulation selection and that it may not be as black and white from the perspective of selecting low molecular weight heparin for all other patients with venous thromboembolism, certainly for mechanical heart valves. They have a little bit of higher risk and it's a balance between risk and benefit. So I'd like to frame um, this presentation on a case. Um, this is a 29 year old female. It's her first pregnancy. She's nine weeks gestation. She had a mechanical aortic valve placement at the age of 18. She had rheumatic heart disease. She's been maintained with warfarin five milligrams daily and her INR is 2.5. Um, so I just have one polling question um, and you'll see the poll come up now. What would you advise again? She's 29 years old. It's her first pregnancy. She's nine weeks. She wasn't expecting to be pregnant. Her warfarin dose is five milligrams. Would you advise her to terminate the pregnancy, change to low molecular weight heparin or continue warfarin? So um, nobody selected terminate the pregnancy, 78% selected change to low molecular weight heparin and 22% indicated um, warfarin. So as you can see, there's already a little bit of lack of uh, agreement about what is the best option. And often it's similar to what Dr. Bates had mentioned, it's really discussing risk and benefit with, with the patients. So the bottom line, and I've used this from a recent publication from the British uh, Society of Hematology is that any patient who has a mechanical heart valve during pregnancy is at very high risk of bleeding and very high risk of thrombosis. And that in this patient population, really preconception counseling is required prior to any pregnancy. But as most know, this often doesn't happen and individuals become pregnant without that preconception counseling. However, currently, because it's now been well established that these patients are at higher, are at higher risk of thrombosis despite the current anticoagulation regimens, that really all women of childbearing age who are about or who require a valve replacement have a detailed discussion about the risk of thrombosis in future pregnancies and perhaps decide with the assistance of their cardiovascular surgeon whether or not a mechanical valve should be placed or a tissue valve. Generally for mechanical heart valves, uh, for individuals with mechanical heart valves who are not uh, pregnant, warfarin or vitamin K antagonists are still the uh, only option for anticoagulation. And what you can see here um, is current recommendations about the anticoagulation regimens for individuals with mechanical aortic valves on the far left and no other risk factors, those with mechanical aortic valves with other risk factors such as thromboembolism, atrial fibrillation, um, LV dysfunction, for instance, or an older um, prosthesis such as a bone cage, and those with mechanical heart valves. The INR for individuals with mechanical aortic valve should be maintained around 2.5 if they don't have any other risk factors. An INR of three for those with additional risk factors, and we'll talk about pregnancy being an additional risk factor, and those with mechanical heart uh, mitral valves, an INR of three. Previous iterations of cardiology guidelines had suggested the addition of aspirin to those patients at lower bleeding risk, um, to reduce the risk of thrombosis, which is not very high in comparison to pregnancy, but most recent iterations actually took that away and suggested um, a more sort of vague uh, recommendation, such as if antiplatelet um, treatment is required just to add low dose um, antiplatelets. There's a newer mechanical valve that's available called the Onyx aortic um, valve. And um, for some Patients, this is a valve that can be replaced, especially when anticipating pregnancy. In this situation, the INR after three months of surgery is a little bit lower, but the recommendation also includes adding aspirin 75 milligrams daily. Well, for pregnancy, as most know, and as Dr. Bates has actually also mentioned, is that warfarin is small. It can easily traverse the placenta. And historically, we know that it's associated with triadogenicity. That triadogenicity can be um, can occur 
generally between six to 12 weeks gestation. Now, a pregnancy test is usually done at about four weeks gestation. So between four to six weeks, if someone is pregnant and using a vitamin K antagonist or warfarin, um, particularly, that risk of teratogenicity doesn't appear to um, affect, that there's a limited effect on the fetus or the embryo at that point in time. It's thought that really between the four to six week period, um, either the um, embryo will pass to six weeks without any risk, or there will be a loss of that pregnancy. But really that risk of teratogenicity is between six to 12 weeks gestation. And besides the fact that vitamin K antagonists um, inhibited factor 2, 7, 9, and 10, they also actually inhibit osteocalcins required for calcification during embryogenesis. And this is the pictures that I have on the slide, which essentially the warfarin syndrome is nasal hyperplasia and epiphyseal stippling. But beyond that 12 week period, warfarin remains small and can still traverse the placenta. So there remains risk to the fetus throughout the pregnancy. And as you can see listed on the left hand of that slide, some of the neurological manifestations that can occur because of the use of vitamin K antagonists during pregnancy, and obviously intracranial hemorrhage because the fetus is anticoagulated can also occur. How much risk really hasn't been well defined, but it remains. And it remains by either identifying that neurological symptom syndrome or um, it's really a loss of that pregnancy overall. And so what generally would happen is that um, warfarin-associated embryopathy or fetopathy may not show those effects, but essentially is reported as a loss of that pregnancy, either in the second or third trimester. So again, the case, she's 29 years old, she's nine weeks gestation, she knows about the risks, you've informed her about the risks of warfarin, and those risks are approximately two um, to 10% risk of teratogenicity in the first trimester. 90% of patients will have a fetus without um, any uh, embryo embryopathy, and she is aware of that risk and decides instead of terminating the pregnancy to either consider low molecular weight heparin and warfarin. Um, as I mentioned, it's been well established that warfarin traverses the placenta, but what is the risk associated with low molecular weight heparin when it comes to live births as well as thrombosis? And what you can see on this slide are three of the common regimens that are used in pregnancy um, when it comes to anticoagulation. So the vitamin K antagonist, low molecular weight heparin, and what is called a combination where between six to 12 weeks gestation, um, if an individual is using warfarin, then low molecular weight heparin is used at a therapeutic dose. And then 12 weeks onward, um, um, there's a transition to warfarin. So that is often referred to as combination or sequential therapy. The, these are results from a systematic review that we had conducted a number of years ago that looked at maternal mortality, thromboembolic complications, and the live birth rate associated with each one of these regimens. And what you can see here is really maternal mortality remains the lowest with vitamin K antagonists. Thromboembolic complications also remain the lowest with vitamin K antagonists, but the live birth rate um, is obviously the highest with low molecular weight heparin because low molecular weight heparin doesn't traverse the placenta. So when having a discussion about which anticoagulation regimen to select, really, it's that balance between the live birth rate and the risk of maternal mortality and thromboembolic complications. Well, lots of literature in the past five years has suggested that using a low dose of warfarin, five milligrams or less than five milligrams, is associated with um, a higher live birth rate um, and fewer fetal anomalies. And certainly our systematic review actually showed the same. And what you can see here is the live birth rate appears to be better um, with lower doses of warfarin and fetal anomaly, anomalies, excuse me, appear to be less as well um, with um, lower doses of warfarin, but, but they're not zero. And the confidence intervals certainly are quite wide. So to actually, um, um, to advise a patient who's on a lower dose of warfarin that, that the risk of teratogenicity is actually nearer to zero, 
is probably not an accurate depiction of what that risk is, um, what that risk actually is. Um, and just again, from clinical experience, we've had patients who have taken warfarin at a dose of five milligrams and have not had a therapeutic INR and have been reassured that the risk of triadogenicity is less and have elected to continue with low dose warfarin despite um, an INR that's therapeutic. And that generally is not advised. The INR needs to be therapeutic, um, whether it uh, needs to be therapeutic and the dose should not be maintained um, at five milligrams just to reduce the risk of triadogenicity and try to improve the live birth rate. Um, because of that risk though being reported in some case series and cohort studies, um, certain guidelines, um, particularly cardiology guidelines, have suggested that warfarin remains a dose for patients if it's less than five milligrams. Um, and what you're seeing on this slide is the European Society of Cardiology Guidelines, and more recently, the American College of Cardiology Guidelines, combined with the American Hematology of uh, American Heart Association Guidelines, that suggest really at a lower dose of warfarin to continue it during pregnancy because of the concern of the thrombotic risk with a low molecular weight heparin. Now, neither would actually advise that warfarin is the only option, low molecular weight heparin also remains an option for this patient population. If the warfarin dose is higher than five milligrams, then low molecular weight heparin is suggested between six to 12 weeks. And as you can see, there's some disagreement in some guidelines suggesting, for, uh, suggesting either warfarin be continued for the remainder of the pregnancy or a transition to low molecular weight heparin. So I just want to go back to the slide of our systematic review um, to show that really the thromboembolic risk remains elevated, whether a vitamin K antagonist is used or low, low molecular weight heparin or whether combination therapy is used. And that's actually higher than it is outside of pregnancy. Well, to reduce that risk, um, Aspirin has been suggested in, in the past. And as I mentioned, um, even outside of pregnancy, aspirin used to be suggested in addition to anticoagulation. And the reason for the use of aspirin outside of pregnancy has predominantly come from this one systematic review that was published many years ago by the Cochrane Collaboration. And what you're seeing in the top part of the slide is mortality and the bottom is thromboembolic events on in the top uh, force plot is the use of aspirin and, or, and an oral anticoagulant on the left and on the right an oral anticoagulant. And as you can see, it looks like mortality is actually a little bit better. And on the bottom slide, thromboembolic events look like there are a little bit, um, the frequency of which is better actually with the addition of aspirin. Now, because um, there appear to be a higher risk of bleeding with the addition of aspirin, the newer iterations or the more recent iteration of the cardiology guidelines, and because the systematic review included publications that were extremely old, suggested to not use aspirin um, as routinely as was previously suggested. But I just like, I would like to highlight about that risk of bleeding overall. And the upper part of this force plot is, you know, uh, aspirin at a regular dose. And in the lower part is low dose aspirin. So our low do the low dose aspirin here is 100 milligrams. The one we generally use, the dosage, dosage in Canada overall is the 81 milligrams that is used with a lower dose of aspirin, that risk of bleeding outside of pregnancy doesn't seem to be increased. So what happens when aspirin is added during pregnancy? There appears to be, again, small case series, not very large, but a reduction in valve thrombosis. And this is just one study that um, has described that reduction in risk and small number of patients. Again, those treated with aspirin, as you can see on the slide, about 13. But those that weren't treated with aspirin or it's much higher number overall seem to have more thrombosis. Again, small sample size is so difficult to be able to extrapolate, but it's definitely suggestive that the addition of aspirin to these patients might result in a reduction in thrombosis. However, there appear to be an increased risk of bleeding, and I'm, I'm going to actually come back to that at the end of the presentation. Um, 
So the alternate to warfarin um, is low molecular weight heparin, and low molecular weight heparin is the standard anticoagulation for pregnancy. During pregnancy for patients with mechanical heart valves, um, a twice daily dose is actually suggested as opposed to a once daily dose. And the rationale for this has been twofold, really. One, that the GFR increases by approximately 50% um, during pregnancy, and you can see how early that GFR increases. So as low molecular weight heparin is excreted by the kidney, predominantly for enoxaparin, less so for um, deltaparin and tinzaparin, um, that some have suggested using a twice daily dose. As well, there appears to be a reduction in the mean and peak anti-10A activities, as you can see in that lower um, graph, um, with the use of low molecular weight heparin. So because it doesn't seem that um, a once daily dose potentially can result in troughs where an individual is subtherapeutic, the current recommendations are if low molecular weight heparin is used, it's really a BID dosing. Now, as I mentioned in that earlier slide, even with low molecular weight heparin, the risk of thrombosis appears to be much higher, even with the addition of aspirin than vitamin K antagonists. That may have been because of some older studies not using adequate dosing of low molecular weight heparin. Suffice it to say, however, that because that risk remains to be elevated, elevated more so than what would be expected with standard dosing of low molecular weight heparin. The current recommendations and what you're seeing on this slide is really the recommendations by the British Society of Hematology. Their guidelines were recently published earlier this year of using enoxaparin instead of at two milligrams per kilo per day at 2.5 mil milligrams per kilo per day, deltaparin at 250 um, units um, per kilo per day, similarly, with tinzaparin. And although tinzaparin is not usually a twice daily dose, um, um, it can be divided for pregnancy. Following as well, uh, I'm sorry, I have about a minute to go, so I'm just gonna go quickly, is targeting peak anti-10A levels of approximately one to 1.4, even though anti-10A levels are not done routinely outside of pregnancy, they are recommended during pregnancy. And the British Society of Hematology suggests low dose aspirin be added as well. So back to the patient, um, what would you choose? Again, it's a discussion with the patient regarding low molecular weight, heparin and warfarin. In this situation, as the British Society of Hematology suggests is the addition of low dose aspirin. Now there are certainly other features that could potentially increase the risk um, besides the standard risk, such as what the American uh, Cardiology Association had suggested, such as an older valve or previous history of left ventricular dysfunction or previous embolic events. And in that situation, warfarin might be the optimum anticoagulation. For all these patients, um, delivery has to be planned. Cesarean section is not necessarily indicated. And discontinuation of anticoagulation is going to be suggested um, as follows. And uh, quickly, just to go through this, with regards to low molecular weight heparin, it needs to be discontinued 24 hours prior to neuroaxial anesthesia to permit for neuroaxial anesthesia. Um, there is a bit of a gray, gray area as to whether unfractionated heparin should be started. If it is unfractionated heparin at a therapeutic dose needs to be discontinued um, four hours prior to neuroaxial anesthesia. If by chance an individual um, is taking a vitamin K antagonist, the vitamin K antagonist can be changed to low molecular weight heparin at 36 weeks, but if preterm delivery occurs, then essentially um, a cesarean section is required. Um, aspirin can be discontinued approximately three days prior to delivery and quickly in the postpartum period. We know that these patients are at high risk of um, bleeding as well, that the current recommendation would be not to transition back to warfarin until approximately seven days postpartum. Uh, stop there, but perhaps I can also add that in the postpartum period, particularly for patients such as this, that actually was not planning a pregnancy is to have that discussion about planning and optimizing future pregnancies. Um, I'll stop there. So we realized that we've gone a little bit long. Um, for those who can stay on, um, we're happy to answer questions.
I've been answering some questions in the Q&A, so you might want to check there and see if that applies to some of the queries you have. And I know Dr. Othman has as well. There was one question in the Q&A that Dr. Othman wanted to answer live, um, and it's yeah, from Dr. So Chaudhry, so mm -hmm. you want to take that? Yeah, so quickly, thank you, Dania. Uh, this is an important question. So that's the hope. We hope that tech will be incorporated in the clinic. Right now, we don't have the large evidence uh, from big studies, but indeed, a small blood sample that is done from the patient as the clinic follow-up can tell you what the cognition profile is like um, and before before chemo. Now, using this with the, with the Corona score is something in the works. We're generating a large sample studies. Right now it's 36 only. We're aiming for at least 100 before we publish this as an evidence that people can use. Thanks so much. Excellent. There was another question that Nadine, Dr. Shahada has answered, but might want to answer more specifically about um, when using aspirin with anticoagulation, when would you stop? Before I'm sorry. Delivery? So there was a question about when you would stop aspirin before delivery. Yeah, so um, the British Society of Hematology suggests stopping approximately three days prior to planned delivery. Now, that is still a gray area. There are people that are more comfortable stopping seven days beforehand, but three days, it's a low-dose aspirin, is, um, it, it's probably okay. I mean, from, from our perspective, we know that a low-dose aspirin of 81 milligrams is not going to result in increased bleeding with neuroaxial anesthesia, but potentially can result in uh, bleeding uh, postpartum. Thank you. And then there was one question that um, Mary Bowman had for you, uh, Dr. Shahada. She has a 15-year-old female with mechanical mitral valve who lives in a fly-in community in the north. She's just reported that she's 15 weeks pregnant and is scheduled for an ultrasound next week. What would be your favored anticoagulant plan, just given that? Yeah, um, so th that's a great question. So I guess she's been exposed to warfarin at, to this point. And so there needs to be a discussion about that risk of triagenicity. And albeit, as I mentioned in the previous slide, it's up to 10%. She needs to be aware of that and to decide whether or not she wants to continue the pregnancy. Um, and it still depends. If she's had a mechanical mitral valve, she's young. So I'm assuming she hasn't had previous embolic event and she hasn't had left ventricular dysfunction and it's a newer valve because some of those uh, risks definitely will increase the risk of thrombosis during pregnancy, and you might elect just to proceed with warfarin just in the uh, proceed with warfarin despite the risks of having a lower live birth rate. If she does not, then it's really having a discussion about continuing with warfarin versus continuing with the BID low molecular weight heparin. But um, I guess my biggest concern is her age and sort of the need to emphasize, you know, the risk of this pregnancy and the need to continuously monitor whether it be the INR if she's on warfarin or at least NT10As or weight-based dosing if she's going to be um, using a low molecular weight heparin. Certainly a very challenging case that I'm, I'm glad Doc, or Mary, Dr. Bauman is managing and not me personally. Um, makes me feel much better. Um, I don't think we have any other questions. So what we'll do is we'll thank you all very much for attending. Um, you'll also thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to spend part of World Thrombosis Day with you and we appreciate your attendance.